Welcome, everybody. It's time once again for the next chapter with Charlie Hedges. As he explores turning the page on his life and yours. Hey, Charlie. Hey, Paul. Today we are reaching back to a guest that we had on the show about one year ago, and that is my son, Austin Hedges. Austin is a professional baseball catcher for the Cleveland Indians. And after nearly a decade of playing since graduating high school for the San Diego Padres, he was traded, was it July or August, Austin, that you were traded to Cleveland? Um, August, almost September. Oh, really? Was it that late? Okay. Yeah, the season was basically only two months this year. Yeah, that's right. That's right. What I hope to chat to about a chat about today has to do with both the inner emotional roller coaster ride of ups and downs, family life, professional life, and the place of dreams in the most competitive of environments, which is professional sports and entertainment. Um, this show will be sort of a, the way I'm imagining it, is sort of a behind the scene view of what it is like to be both hero and underappreciated. Fans are fickle, and they frequently feel the right to express their opinion. Many of them are very positive and sometimes not so positive. And in addition, I want to get into a look at what is life during the season, which is close to half a year or maybe a little bit more than half a year, and life during the off season. So I would like baseball fans to understand what life is like for a baseball player in real life. Um, you up to that, son? Sure. Let's do it. Okay. So um, let me be official and say, Austin Hedges, welcome to the next chapter with your dad. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. You are so um, articulate. So you know what I thought I might do, Austin, is start at the beginning. You know, as a kid, your mom and I just delighted that you always excelled in every sport, basketball, football, soccer, lacrosse, who knows what all. But you decided that baseball was the one you wanted to pursue. And at only 10 years old, you declared rather, I, I want to say almost not quite defiantly, but rather strongly, that when you were going to grow up, you were going to be a professional baseball player without understanding what all that took. What what was it, Austin, that made you feel that strongly about being a baseball player? For some reason, I guess it caught my attention at a super early age. I think I think that decision was probably made earlier than that without even knowing what a professional baseball player was. I think something about watching the game on TV or live just captured me where it was so early that it's not even I want to do that like I want to do what they're doing I just want to I just want to be where they are almost and so I think over the over the next handful of years when I started understanding and just grow, I mean just growing up a little bit I was probably three or four years old I you think, felt at three or four years old that's what you that's what you saw yourself doing I mean yeah but I didn't know it was going to be like I didn't know that was like a big deal or anything. It was just that, like, I, I, I just wanted to be, I just wanted to do what they were doing. I don't even know if I understood the concept of baseball completely. Like it was just, I just like, I, I enjoyed that. And I just, I wanted to do what they were doing. And so I feel like that just stuck in my brain. So anytime, no matter what I was doing, it was just always in my brain. Like, just like, remember, remember what the goal is at all times, no matter what I was doing, there was only one goal. You know, when you said your one goal, and, and it started at such an early age, what do you think drove you to just be so singularly minded about a goal? Was it that we watched baseball so much? Did that have an influence, or was it something else that was going on? I think it challenged my brain. There was a whole lot going on, I think, uh, to a much deeper level than, than other sports. The main thing that attracted me was the complexity and the competition ultimately I just wanted to compete. I wanted to, once we started getting like, like winning and losing was, was everything. It was, I, I, I had to win. I wanted to win at everything I did and I despised losing and baseball offered that on a, every game has a, you know, you win or you lose. And there was nothing 
you know, there's nothing better than going out and winning a baseball game. There's nothing worse than going out and losing it. And the beauty of both of them is the, the winning makes you want some more and the losing makes you never want to experience that again. So you got to make sure you don't lose anymore. It's interesting. You would say that. I remember quite a few years ago, I was listening to an interview with Joe Montana and Joe Montana says your highest level athletes are not driven by the desire to win. They're driven by the hatred of losing. Does that resonate with you at all? Yeah, it's for sure both, no doubt. I don't think it's – I'm not sure it's the healthiest way to go about it. Maybe and maybe <laughs> before before I used to probably hate to lose more than I love to win, and I think I don't have a little bit to, to make sure that we're sticking with the positive things. It's definitely a healthier way to live, to not hate to lose at that extreme level. That's got to be negative on you emotionally, doesn't it? Yeah, just when you when you play so many games in so many days, you can't let something like that phase you for for a second because you got to show up and be ready to go the next day. That is the truth of baseball that many people understand, but if they're not avid sports, they really don't understand that you know you play a 162 game season and then how many games in in spring training? Another 25 to 30 games. Yeah, it's basically if you play. If you go to Game 7 of the World Series, I, I think it's like 213 or so games from spring training to the playoffs. So if you have, you know, you have to expect, if you, if you want to do the ultimate thing in the sport, there's a good chance you might go to seven games. So it's just, if, if you do that, though, and you win, you're going to be playing between 200 and, you know, nine and 213 games, including spring training. And that's, that's a lot of that's, that's, <laughs> the majority of the days. That's two thirds of a year. You know, you have what two to three day off day, two to three days of off days at most. Yeah, that's uh, that's one of the other special things of our sport is that it it's a grind, and one, and and the best in the game are able to show up on a daily basis and not let the the toll on toll affect them. And I'm just I'm, I'm constantly impressed with guys that can do that because it is it's extremely hard, mostly mentally to just to be locked in on a daily basis. <laughs> you would really like a day off, but if you don't get that day off and you got to keep going, you got to, you got to make sure you're locked in. And that is definitely something the best to. I sort of think of baseball and golf are just so mental. You've got to be into the game just 100% of the time, especially as a catcher, you have no relief except for maybe a, a few at bats in the dugout. But then in the dugout, when your team is batting, you're studying charts and talking with pitchers. You're never off. You know, it's a blessing and it's a curse because, you know, it's obviously it's difficult to, to stay locked in 100% of the time. It's just, you know, it's, it's something that's very hard to do. But at the same time, it does help me not think about it back. I have to be locked in. In a way, it's a, it's a nice thing for me to have because I can, I got to lock in. I got to make sure I'm calling the right pitch because if I don't, then I'm impacting the pitcher and his ERA and his career and the team and our record and everything. I mean, you, that's a really selfish thing to do. So it kind of does help take your mind off of what's happened in the past and kind of flush it and move on. Yeah, but, and you know, in a catcher, make no mistake, everybody is on the field is into every pitch. They're watching the signals, they're watching what's going on, but they're not in the decision-making process that a catcher has to be on because for a large part, Pitchers get credit for, oh, they threw a great curve, but that was really the catcher that called that curve, was it not? Well, I mean, the pitcher's got to execute the pitch. And honestly, one of the things I try and remind the pitchers, basically any pitch executed is always the right pitch. So I don't really care oh. if, you shake, if you want to call anything. If you execute a pitch, a good pitch, the numbers say that you should have a very high success rate uh, or a good chance of getting the hitter out or a swing and a miss or weak contact, something like that, which is really all we're trying to do. So it's more so one of the things other than what the right pitch is or the wrong pitch is to get the hitter out. A lot of times with game calling, you need to throw a pitch to help the pitcher get some confidence where they might be struggling with a certain pitch. A lot of times when guys are throwing and they get erratic with their fastball, it's actually wise to throw a breaking ball just to have them feel something a little bit different. It usually helps them get a little bit more extended, and really anything else just to just 
get their mind off of continuing to throw fastballs that aren't executed. And a lot of times after they throw that, say they throw a slider, a lot of times it's a slider for a strike. And then they come back with another fastball and it's a lot more executed. So there's definitely more nuances to just than to just simply trying to get the hitter out because when it's all said and done, it's all about your pitcher. So if it's all about your pitcher, on a catcher, it would seem to me that it's very important for a catcher to do two things. One is to constantly encourage that pitcher and make that pitcher feel strong, make that pitcher feel confident that he could make the out. But that requires you're being a shrink. You're being a therapist behind the plate because every pitcher has a different personality and every pitcher is motivated by some different strategy or different kind of talk or different kind of college. You have to know deeply a dozen guys yeah, that's, that's something I, I do try and talk about a lot because I think the number one thing on the on the totem pole of, of catching, I think, you know, physically it starts with receiving, then blocking, then throwing. And there's a couple others that just they, just based off of, I guess, things that happen. You know, you catch more pitches than you block, and you block more pitches than you attempt to throw guys out. So that's the totem pole for the physical side. But then the things that are actually above that are – the game calling and the relationship with your pitcher is always number one. And where that starts is in the clubhouse and off the field, ideally. You don't necessarily have to have a relationship off the field. You just have completely no common interests. But ideally, you have somewhat of a relationship off the field. No matter what, have an excellent relationship at the field. And I just take a lot of pride in making sure that all my teammates, but I think my, my pitchers specifically, know that they have a relationship with me where they can come and talk to me and I can talk to them at any point. And there's nothing that we don't know or aren't prepared for going into a game. And if we're not on the same page, it's an easy discussion. It's an easy conversation. We can make adjustments quicker. And then once that happens and they understand how much I care about them, just trying to get them to have good numbers and help the team win too. Then once we're on the field, the, the trust factor is already there. So they trust me as a person which is ultimately just all we are. We're just a couple of human beings playing catch with a baseball ultimately. And when he trusts me back there, then he has confidence to then trust me maybe more with game calling and he can just focus on executing pitches. It's a very difficult thing that not many pitchers can do is to call their own game and then still execute at a high level. I'm just kind of trying to take the burden off of them to let them just execute their talent and execute the reason they are in the big leagues with what they can do with their arm. So absolutely, I gotta. I definitely have to be part-time therapist, psychologist, whatever. That's got to be, yeah. Um, just to make sure I have a good relationship with them. And you know, you can see that with certain pitchers that I know of, and I'm sure you know more. But you know, Clayton Kershaw has his catcher, Garrett Cole has his catcher that is not always the starting catcher for the team, but they're the ones that they click. They understand each other. Clayton and Garrett will feel much more comfortable throwing to these individuals and to another catcher. Is that not correct? Yeah, that sometimes is the case with the big dogs, the aces of teams, where a lot of times it's with weaker offensive catchers. They're basically assuming they don't need as much offense for the game uh, to make sure their starting pitcher is extremely comfortable. And, you know, it's more for uh, just a defensive strategy. It might be a weaker offensive guy that they just want the pitcher to be comfortable. So knowing he's going to go out and give up, you know, zero, one or two runs. Yeah, and then you win games. I kind of want to go back when you were a kid and you were thinking that you wanted to be a baseball player. Did you have any idea how virtually impossible that was, that you know the odds of you becoming a professional baseball player were really more than remote? I was aware of the numbers my whole life, and it was almost like more motivation because it's like, oh, that's going to be really cool when – I can say I'm a part of that tiny percent of baseball players that just make it to the big leagues. And, you know, it's definitely something that I try and look back on as often as possible. Just, I guess, humble myself was that my goal was always just to make it to the big leagues. And now that I've made it, I need to remind myself that along with the hard work, I need to be able to enjoy myself and enjoy the ride of, you know, the thing that I worked so hard for my whole life, just to, just to be an experience. And, it is, uh, and it was well worth all the hard work because just the experience of being in the big leagues, just in the small period of time I've been there, is 
is an experience that is tough to put into words. What do you look forward to most as a player on a baseball team? Is it the playing? Is it the clubhouse? Is it the strategy? Is it the watching film, you know, all of the preparation? Is it the beers after the game? What do you look forward to? Every single one of those every single day. They're all the highlight of my day. When I'm doing all all those things you said, I promise you I got a smile on my face while I'm doing all those. So whether it's in the film room, I got a smile on my face because that's where, that's where I do my work and that's where I do all my digging that uh, I think is, is something that can set you really against somebody else in a, in a good way. How much time before a game do you spend in the film room? The film room on day one of the series is a long time. Luckily, over the course of my career, I've, I've figured out how to kind of speed that process up a little bit. It used to be upwards of three hours. Now it's probably about an hour and a half on day one of a series and then probably about 45 minutes to an hour on the other days. And what are you looking for? Are you looking for everything about the other team or are you looking at your team as well? I ideally have been given a bunch of information already from the advanced scouting team. They'll even have the specific video to show. All the numbers are there for me, which used to not be. used to kind of have to put, look up a lot of the numbers, but instead the numbers are given to me and I then try and go find the detail. So the numbers say, this guy is not hitting sliders right now. I want to know why. Because some people say numbers don't lie, and numbers absolutely lie in baseball. Because a guy could see, let's say the last 10 sliders he's seen, he's 0 for 10. So I'm like, oh, wow, this guy's hitting zero in his last 10 at-bats on slider. Slider's going to be a really good option. But if I go watch the video five of those 10 outs were absolute missiles right to someone. So if those balls fall like they should have, now he's hitting 500 on sliders. And if I saw that, I'd be terrified. I'd be like, no, 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 I'm not throwing them sliders. And the same thing vice versa. If I see a guy's hitting 500 on curveballs, then I go watch the film, and four of those five hits are little dinky infield hits or bloopers, then I'm, I'm not afraid to call that pitch then. So the video tells you things that, the numbers themselves can't tell you. How do you remember all this stuff? I noticed you, you wear a little wristband. Do you still wear that or, or do you not? Occasionally, occasionally I do. I like to not wear it because I like to trust my gut. All the preparation is, those are just guidelines. Those are suggestions that what you've seen in the past is going to work. But when you're in the middle of the game and you see something and you feel something, you got to go with your gut because one of my favorite coaches ever, Darren Balsley, are, would tell me, he's like, hitters are allowed to get better. You know what I mean? Big leaguers are allowed to get better. So it's like, oh, this guy stinks on this pitch and he hits a home run. It's like, he's a really good player because he's in the big leagues and he's allowed to make an adjustment and get better. So, you know, sometimes the numbers tell you one thing and after an at-bat or two, you got to make an adjustment in the middle of the game. You, you don't want to practice the definition of insanity. You want to make the adjustment. And at the same time, Sometimes you don't make an adjustment. That's the beauty of all the decisions you have to make is, you know, do we, do we stick with the game plan or do we need to call an audible right here? You know, it is so much more complicated than when listening to a game because, you know, my feeling about sportscasters in baseball, and I'm crazy enough to think I know as much as they do, and I'm always in disagreement with them. But I don't think it's really shows enough preparation that players put in prior to a game. And if you're playing 162 games, it's just one boatload of study and preparation that you're doing before a game just to get your knowledge. And then you have to work on your mechanics, your mental attitude, your team attitude. It is a grind. Do you have before a game, do you have time to rest? Or are you just working that entire time? I mean, it's not, you know, it's not just go the entire time. I think that's the, the cool part about it is while you're working, you're working with all your teammates who are all your peers going through the exact same stuff. So there's, there's a bunch of dudes that are as relatable as you could ever imagine, like just 25 guys all grinding at the exact same level. So you're going through it with a bunch of guys going through the same thing. And then you're, you're BSing in the locker room for a, a chunk of the day too. So it's not all work. We definitely we definitely have fun while we do it, too. That's great. So we've been talking about 
we've been talking about the mental aspects and, and the grind of the game, I, or, or about the game itself. I want to talk now, I want to change it, and I want to talk about sort of personal life and personal life questions and how you deal with pressure and how you deal with it, what your life is like during the season, your life during the off season and, and relationship with fans and relationships with family. And I think this would probably, Paul, be a great time to take a break and because we're going to, we're going to come to a whole different set of questions after this. So hang in there, Austin. We're going to take a brief break. Hi, this is Charlie Hedges, and you're listening to The Next Chapter with Charlie. And today, I'm talking to my um, all-time favorite guest, Austin Hedges, who's a catcher for the Cleveland Indians. And we are talking, I'm, I'm titling it, and I may title it differently once it's, once it's published, but I'm thinking the unknown or secret life of a professional athlete, sort of information that, that the public doesn't get via media or via... Well, any kind of media, whether it's written or uh, microphoned. So I want to get a bit into your personal life. At 19 years old, you were drafted right out of high school by the San Diego Padres. So as a 19-year-old, you moved from California with your family to Indianapolis and moved for the first time living on your own. You left continual support, parental support, team support, and you moved into a very competitive environment where everybody, you think everybody's a great teammate and having great fun, but everybody's fighting for a job. Everybody wants to make the big leagues. This was what's called single A. Tell me about that experience of moving from a very supportive environment to a very competitive environment. Was there, was there a change in mental attitude in that? Not really. I was competing for so long. And competing at, I feel like, in, in really challenging environments my whole life. So I was on to the next competition. I was on to the next challenge. And it was definitely the hardest one I'd ever done because I had to grow up while I was doing it. First time on my own. I'm in the middle of the country where weather is now a factor. Um, I never had to deal with the cold or severe heat before. And now I'm thrown over there and it's freezing and snowing one game and a few months later it's 120 degrees out so uh, meanwhile just living in an apartment with another teammate you know paying rent and doing doing grown-up stuff and I'm 19 just do your laundry and do well you lived on paper plates probably yeah I'm <laughs> I mean I'm <laughs> I'm pretty low maintenance when it comes to that that's less clean I, I I don't think from a competition level it was it threw me off as much as just having to learn to connect with, with a bunch of dudes that were significantly older than me. And, you know, there's a couple guys my age that were drafted out of high school. There's a lot of guys that were just fresh out of college, a couple years out of college. So these are 23, 24, 25 year old guys. And I'm 19. That's a, that's a, that's a graduated college guy talking to a freshman right now. But at the same time, I think it really did help me grow up very quickly you mentioned something about competition. Wouldn't you say that's always been one of your strongest attributes is that you are just a competitor, that you will go out there and you do whatever it takes to win? Yeah, that's, uh, I've just, I think I've always related to the guys that talk about that. There's, there's so many of my favorite athletes in the world that just, that just talk about like, you're just, you're just not going to outwork them. You're not going to compete them. You're not going to out prepare them. And I'm like, those are all things I can control. And I'm so aware of how, how little control I have, but how I work, how I prepare and how I compete are all up to me. And you have to be more talented than me because, because you're not going to work as, as, as hard as I'm going to work. And that's kind of the chip that I have on my shoulder always moving forward, no matter, you know, how many times, you know, I, you suck and you, and you, and you fail and you don't perform well and you lose doesn't mean like you're done. You're not going to let you like I've lost that, that competition drive. That means it makes you even hungrier. So, but it's a blast. Like it's, it's what I want to do all day, every day. I just want to go, I just want to, I want to go compete, man. 
Do you have any role models for competition that are just strictly just solid competitors that they are just going to do whatever it takes to win? I've met a handful in my, uh, in my career that on the baseball side, guys like Clayton Richard, he was a pitcher for the Padres guys like him. Just, I think guys that have a certain level of mental toughness that are ready to go out and play every single day and do it while leading by example and making no excuses, holding people accountable. I think those are, uh, really good qualities that not a, not a whole lot of guys have that, that I've seen, but, Clayton was definitely one of them. Craig Stammen was one of them. AJ Ellis, Eric Hosmer. I mean, I could go on and on. There's, I got, I got a ton of favorite teammates, but there's definitely guys that that I've played with that that inspire me to to be like that, and you know, kind of pass it on to the next generation coming up. That's very important to you too, isn't it? I was talking to somebody, and they they were talking about competition on a baseball team, and and how you were in competition with another catcher at San Diego for the starting position, and you told me he's probably one of your very best friends on the team, and people would think guys in competition are not friends, but somebody told me that game understands game, and that if you got game, you understand somebody else with game, and and you just take delight in watching them work. And And you had a great friendship with a guy that was supposed to be in competition with you, did you not? Yeah, I think I I was kind of taught that from from the get go. My first couple of years in in big league spring training, when I first got invited to big league spring training, I had a couple guys, Nick Hundley and Yasmani Grandal, both took me under their wing. And I'm the young guy just drafted, coming up trying to take their job, and they're showing me the ropes. They're showing me how to work, how to prepare, how you know what it's like to be a big league catcher. So once they did that, they kind of set the tone for me to be like, all right, this is this is the way to do it. This is the human aspect of a sport that tries to dehumanize us being it's just another human going through the exact same thing as you and you might as well help each other and look out for each other because that's going to make that ride a whole lot more enjoyable and it's not easy it's definitely not easy at times but it's definitely the right way to go and i think if anything it's good karma you know what you put out into the world like i think you get that back eventually at some point wasn't it yasmani grandal that taught you in spring training to be the first man in the in the clubhouse, no matter what hour yeah. that was. And you were there at yeah. a ridiculous hour, like 545 or whatever it was. Yeah, he was, uh, he was a very good influence on me to just show me how to work and how to prepare. That's very kind. Tell me something. One thing that we are not used to, the average public, we think something about being in the public eye and other people's impressions of us and what do people think of us. But... Nobody faces the public eye like an athlete or an entertainer or a musician, you know, actors. What is the most challenging thing you find about being in the public eye and everybody feeling they have a right to evaluate you and to let you know how they evaluate you? What's the what's what's the, the most challenging aspect of that? Really, all of that stuff is pretty challenging. So that's why I personally stay off social media and just don't pay any attention to it. But there are obviously times and plenty of situations where you are aware and you see some of the good things, which are great, and you see some of the bad things, which, you know, they don't feel so good. The way that <laughs> I, think, I think the most challenging part is when, when the things are negative, it's, you feel disappointed in yourself. Like you feel like, you let you let the fans down. You let these people down. Where you just want to. It's it's a confusing thing the the media and the fans because their criticisms. If you really ask yourself if they meant anything to you, you like you'd say no. But every single one of us as a human, especially a human who whose life goal was to be a performer, I guess, which I was to go perform at a in front of thousands of people playing a sport. So. You obviously, like subconsciously at least, wanted to impress them. You know, you want to get good press. You want to be on Sports Center. You want people to say good things about you. But it stinks when they feel like they need to say some bad things about you. How does that impact you off field? The negative things that you said you heard is that impactful off the field? Does that impact your family and and your life? 
I'm sure it does impact people. It, it, it doesn't impact me in the slightest. I've, I've had to learn that. Uh, How do you do that? Hard way. You know what it's like to be miserable at the field and away from the field. Both are a choice, but the one at home is, is the choice that has to be made. You can get away with being miserable at your job, still function, but you can't be, you can't be miserable at home and have high quality of life. So when I was bringing my work home with me, like then I'm just living a, just a miserable life. So a lot of practice and a lot of experience, I do it. I've learned how to, how to do that. And now I let my real life kind of take precedent over my business life. And I let, instead of kind of turning on and off, I just try and let who I am away from the field be present at the field too. And then when it's time to play, like you just turn, then it's time to play, but keeping it human, I guess. Life, it seems in general, is just dehumanizing. Like it's everyone has a, is what they do or is what the color of their skin or their sexuality. They're not just, it, it feels that way a lot in the public, I guess, as we're talking, it is quite dehumanizing. And I, so I just try and make it as human as possible. Are you, are you at home been married for a year, but you've been with your wife for eight years? Is that right? You've been with Maggie for eight years? Nine now, yeah. Nine nine now? Forever. More than a third of your life. That's hard to believe, isn't it? Yeah. Um, is there a different Austin during the season and during off season? Is there a different Austin? Um, when I'm not being my best self, yes. When I'm being my best self, no. Um, it's very easy to have two different parts just because there's significantly more stress just because it's the most stressful thing. And then in the off season, there's just zero stress because you don't have to do anything. I don't know. You set your own schedule. So basically, for eight months out of the year, I'm on someone's schedule. And I think that's stressful in general, just being on, being on the clock. You're always on someone else's time. And then during the off season, you're on no one's time. I think one of the things that's helped is I kind of am always on the clock. And once I've kind of tried to learn this whole husband thing, I realize in the off season and even during the season, I got to be on the clock for my wife and be a good husband first and foremost. And um, when I do that, I think it helps me be more consistent during the off season and during the season. During the season, do you find yourself being you know, holding your emotions close to your vest or, or do you or do you try to express your emotions to your wife or do you do you keep them self to yourself and so she's kind of wondering what you like. I mean, I'm not necessarily talking about you personally because everybody is different. What do you what do you think would be typical with players? Do you think they keep a lot of things internally closed? I think there's a little bit of everything. I have met families that tell each other absolutely everything i've met some that are like they know it's baseball season and they know they're kind of getting the shut off version of a guy so that's a personal thing everyone's relationship is different but for me i don't know i think you try not to let the emotions of the the roller coaster of the season and of life impact who you need to be in that moment and for that day you know one of the things i was thinking about and i was thinking about baseball wise I, I think about baseball wise every now and then and and obviously think about Maggie, who, you know, we just thank the world. Of. She's just wonderful that she has two different lives for sure, because during the season, you're gone a lot. And during the off season, you're around a lot. Does she have to make an adjustment of Austin not here? I've got my freedom. I can kind of do what I want to do. And then, oh, my goodness, here he is 24 hours a day. Is that a switch for her? Absolutely. She definitely has to make that switch. And she's learned through successes and failures over the years, too, of how to cope with the massive life change every time a season starts and ends. And every, I think every offseason has just kind of gotten a little bit better, a little bit smoother. But it's, it's something that's it's not like you're going to master it, but I feel like over the years we've definitely learned how to, how to have a, a functioning off-season relationship. I've noticed the last couple of years, and I've really noticed it this year, your off-season is very intentional, that you have times that you want to get away that are intentional, your anniversary and 
and Maggie's birthday comes up in November, or, you know, came up in November, and then you plan vacations and you've got your workouts planned. It seems like your off season is very intentional uh, rather than just sort of loosey goosey. There's a loosey goosey attitude as well, but it's very intentional. Do you like that change to where you're you're a bit more planned and a bit more structured in the off season than you were in the beginning? Absolutely. I think just just in just in growing up and maturing, I've realized I had to, and I used to just kind of want to go with the flow and kind of wing everything and not really know what's what's ahead. And I just got a lot more responsibilities now. And if those responsibilities aren't nurtured and taken care of, then then you let those responsibilities down. That's not a good thing. So I, I've learned how to, um, I guess, prioritize things in my life and make, and in doing so, you have to learn the things that aren't priorities and how to let those things go. And in doing so, I've de- it's definitely helped me focus on the right thing. That's great. I've got just one and a half or two more questions. I'm thinking about what is your observation we are inundated with and just so immersed in popular personalities, you know, the Kardashians, and, and we have views of them and the, and the public views of them. What is your impression of public persona and a private persona? Do you think people are very different publicly than they are privately? Do you think what we're seeing when we see these people publicly we're not seeing who they are personally, or do you think they're rather revealing? At a certain level, it's tough to be super revealing so everyone knows everything about you. I think, I mean, everyone's different, but I think there definitely are a lot of people that have to put a facade on just to just so they can survive. I think that's okay because your privacy is your privacy and how you want to be perceived is a choice. I mean, I can't imagine what, what some people have to go through, but but for me, I try and stay true to myself as, as much as I can. But there's definitely a point where you kind of got to put the game face on and kind of have that tunnel vision and not let, not let any, any distractions phase you. What exercises or, or what do you do to understand when you said the true self, the true you, what's the who you are? How do you go about determining what that is in spite of all of this, outside of this outside influence? It's they're trying to tell you who you are. I've just been blessed to have read a lot of really, really good books and led by the Bible. And I have conversations with myself all day, every day. And those conversations are basically, as I've realized, are uh, with God inside me. Like, so I've just kind of learned how to trust my gut and listen to my gut. And I just kind of, to do the right thing in every single given moment is something that I think we're all aware of and capable of. It's just about doing it. And so I try to have as many conversations with, with myself basically as possible. And I, I tend to surprise myself in how many answers I have to just how to be 24-7. We all have a choice. To how, how are we going to be right now? And it's just I don't get upset. I don't get rattled about things. It's, it's very hard to throw me off. I'm always asking, like, how should I be right now? And I definitely don't try and like, I'm not in denial about feelings and emotions either. I try and like, I, how should I take this emotion? I need to like, I have it. Okay. I'm angry right now. Okay. Why am I angry? And that, and I have, and I just walk through the process that I feel like everybody knows how to do, but I just allow myself to walk through that process constantly. And when I do that on a daily basis it, at right now, it's almost like it's autopilot. Like, and also it's easy to, I feel like I'm quicker to understand when I, when I do fail. Cause I fail, I do fail all the time. And, but when I do, I, I know what I need to do differently. I the adjustment I have to make. You know, it, it seems like this experience that you've had is incites a level of maturity that is unusual for younger age people because of all the pressure, the opinions, the outside influence, you have to deal with it at a level that, Most people never have to deal with their entire life, and they're learning to deal with it through much of their life, and you're forced to it at a very young age. It does help in growing into a more mature individual, do you think? Absolutely. 
Um, I, I'm blessed to play a sport that teaches you how to fail. And once you fail so many times, you, it just teaches you that, that you don't have to take things so seriously and you don't have to let things phase you so much. You know, it's, especially if you have faith, it doesn't really matter when it's all said and done. doesn't mean you're not going to give your best and try and do your best, but it all just doesn't really matter because we're meant for something so much more. That's powerful. Let me let me close with this, and it's and it's probably just I, I may be repeating my question, but um, the concept of improvement is always important in athletics. It's often more about your own impression on your improvement and how that frequently impacts how you feel about yourself, but it is impacted by how others feel. Now, I know for those of us in regular life that are not in in public life, if we get a negative feedback from an individual or a group, you know, we can get 10 positive things said about us, but if we get one negative thing said about us, that's what consumes us for a week. What kinds of suggestions do you have for those of us who live ordinary lives or non-public lives, what do you suggest we do to not take those personal negative comments so seriously that they impact the way we feel about ourselves and the way we behave? Did that question make sense? Absolutely. It's, it is a complex question. And the answer I have is I would practice non-judgment. I think everything that we're afraid of how we usually react to is are we project that onto other people, whether we do anything about it, say anything or not, we're still making judgments constantly instead of just taking things for how they are just every single thing for how it is no more, no less and be okay with it. So I think it's practicing non-judgment and practicing acceptance and being able to let things go. And the more you practice it on constantly throughout the day, without an agenda and just going by going about each day without judgment and only curiosity and love for everybody. Then when they say something bad to you, you're like, I mean, that sucks. I still love you because you're human. You're God's child, but that sucks. You said that, but you're on to the next one. And then the most basic recommendation would be to get off social media and don't read your comments. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's really the, the message for everybody today is get off social media. You know, I've got to tell you now, and I'll close with this story. My wife and I, your mom, and I are getting along extraordinarily well. And I think without you suggesting that, both of us have entered into the realm, especially of this COVID, where we're we're together all the time, is that we've dropped judgment, expectations, and moved into a realm of acceptance, of acceptance that, that she is different than me, I am different than her, but neither is more right than the other, except for acceptance and not judging it. And, and I've got to tell you, those two words are huge. There's a, there's a book on those two words. I'm not saying it's out there, I'm saying it could be written being not judgmental and being accepting. And when we do that, then we're not so much personalizing it, are we, son? I'm sorry, I had you on mute so you couldn't hear my dogs barking. Yeah, <laughs> <exactly>. <laughs> your great Dane in your lab. Uh, yeah, they're, they're a couple of monsters. It was but a great yeah, Dane, big... yeah. So I, I, I do agree with your non-judgmentalism and acceptance. So if you were to give a final word to people about dealing with a competitive life where you are evaluated constantly and where people feel free to tell you how they feel about you, positive and negative, do you have anything special you would like to tell someone like that? Because I have a lot of folks in a lot of disciplines that that feel that I think you just got to love everyone, no matter what. I think it comes down to love, love God, love your neighbor, love yourself. 
practice those things and it sums up every single thing. If you, if you feel a certain way, you're like, all right, what am I supposed to do? It's a negative thing. I'm supposed to love my neighbor. All right. Jesus said so. So it's basically just, I don't know. He told us to do a couple things and they're pretty simple. You just ask yourself if every, you know, in each moment is that, did I, did I answer that question? Yes or no in all circumstances. And I think that if you stick to those things, it kind of, the rest will take care of itself. Oh, I, I, I so, I so agree, son. I, you know, that is just, you know, Jesus even said this sums up the whole Bible. You know, if you, if you want to read the Bible, read Matthew, is it 24? I think it's maybe Matthew 24. I'm not sure. But to the whole law and the prophets, everything is summed up in love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, love your neighbor as yourself. And that includes loving yourself. I always like to bring that. That does include loving yourself and feeling good about yourself. Thanks for that reminder, Austin. You got it. Okay, Austin Hedges, like always, it's, um, you know, your dad's pleasure to talk to you. And I'm, um, I'm, I'm so happy that you could find time in your in your relaxing time as you are playing with your dogs and enjoying your wife and enjoying your life. Thank you for tuning in with me and good luck. I know you're going to the DMV today. Good luck at the DMV. (laughs) I also want to thank our listeners for tuning into the next chapter with Charlie and be sure to check us out at our website. And, and I encourage you to tell your friends about our show, the podcast and the blog. We are uh, gaining popularity And we would love to include your friends. And until next, this is Charlie Hedges signing off. Bye for now.